So thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at your events. There's uh, several events I've done. Uh, and thanks for all of you for spending, spending your evening with me rather than at your families. <laughs> so uh, great. And uh, just to get started, just want to get an idea how many of you are entrepreneurs? Oh, almost half. And how many of you are here just to learn what 5G is? That's good, about half and half, uh, roughly. Some are overlap, of course, that's, that's good. So when Rob asked me to, do you mind if I put this away and just talk louder? Can you hear me all? Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'm going to put this away. I guess it will turn off by itself. So when Rob asked me to come and talk about how 5G will change everything, and I'm sitting here like, we're hardly beginning in 5G. How can I say what happens 10 years from now? We don't know. And how many of you have been following the growth of LTE or prior 3G, 5G, 2G, and all that? When LTE started, I mean, the work started way back when, but the deployment started around 2008, 2009. How many of you knew that Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and these companies will be around? And you cannot live without them, especially in business travels. Anybody? That's what's happening in 5G. And that's why we say it will change everything. We don't know how, when, but it will change everything. So uh, just to give you a little background, uh, you may be thinking, what am I doing being at HTC? Can you read? Yeah. Being at HTC, what am I doing with 5G? So for one, as a smartphone manufacturer and also in the virtual reality and augmented reality, integrating 5G and AI in those devices, we are deep into 5G. Prior to that, I was at SK Telecom for seven, almost seven years, and 5G was one of the areas we were involved in. And if you're following the news, SK Telecom was among the first operator that deployed 5G in more than half the country, in just like that. So. Uh, so I've been, and I've been communication area for practically all my uh, career through the, my technical engineering days as well as as a VC for the last 20 years or so. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just take you back a little bit into the history of the whole cellular um, evolution and then talk about what is 5G. Why do we need 5G? Why can't LTE at uh, 6, 7 megabit per second speeds and a peak of 14, 15 megabit, do what we need to do. And what is special about 5G? And then is it real hype or reality? We'll talk about how much deployment has been done and what's the time frame look like. And then what does it bring economically to, uh, to the world and how much will it cost to get there? Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, some examples of applications and services. It's not an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea how practically everything will change. How many of you remember this? <laughs> yeah. So this is where we were just about 40 years ago. And here we are talking about a device that we don't know. A lot of people are saying that device is not your phone that you know today. It's probably this, this or a contact lens at some point. So the evolution, uh, many of us use the 2Gs. 3G was the first smartphone. HTC was the first one to come out with a smartphone uh, back in, in uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2007, 2004. Uh, if you remember the you know, T-Mobile Evo Touch, and uh, that was HTC phones that came out, and then the form factor evolved from there. And then 2011, when iPhone 4G came out, uh, and iPhone 4, I mean, and then the Samsung Galaxy came out at the same time, and that's where the 4G evolution, which is sort of LTE, but kind of pre-LTE. And then eventually, we have LTE, what we have today. And what did they enable? So 2G was simply a mobile voice, effectively a replacement for your landline phone. Yeah, so you can use it on the go. 3G then brought in uh, some functionality of uh, you know, uh, the smartphone, primarily through, if you remember, WAP, wireless access protocol with the hard-coded applications, and you can hardly do anything, until 2007 when Apple launched I iPhone 3G, which was the first one you can use in App Store and customize your own user experience on the phone. 
And then the LTE came. That was the low speed. Uh, so this one, like we are talking 128 kilobit kind of speeds. Uh, this one was closer to 200 uh, kilobit speeds. And then from there on, LTE migrated into more of a packet-based technologies. And as a result, it became more IP-oriented rather than old landline technology of TDMA. And was, with that came voice over LTE, uh, other uh, IP-based networks, and then the cloud, uh, cloud-based services, uh, which is where your Uber and all these kind of services eventually got enabled with that. And then some functions of uh, uh, IoT started coming in a little bit, but uh, it's not pervasive. Yes, yeah, it's, it's happening, but not that much. Your smart home devices and all that are running through Wi-Fi. But the LTE-based devices are very few. Uh, and then the 5G will come in, and it's just it's, a, it's not exhaustive. It's just can imagine affecting practically everything. Oh, there you go. Okay, so technically, what's happening is, as I said, speed-wise, your 1G, the development started in 1970, but uh, deployment practically ended in 84. It, so the first date is the deployment. Uh, sorry, the development started. Second date is when they practically ended that deployment completely and started phasing it out. So 4G, you see 2000 to 2010. So 2010 is when basically the original 4G was deployed. But then came the 4G advanced, the LTE, LTE advanced, and all that, which are variations of 4G. And today what you have is sort of tail end of LTE advanced, which is what we're using today. And 5G is starting this year. So, and that will go on for whatever time. So, now, having seen what happened through 4G, question, what is 5G? The vision of 5G is unlimited experience for everything with instant action. And what we mean, unlimited experience, meaning, so, well, we have that today. No, we don't. We are limited to the network capacity, the capabilities of the network, when it comes to instant action, how many times you have uh, tried to go to a certain app or a website and it just sits there for a few seconds or half a second or something, 5G is not supposed to do that. And how it's going to enable that is extreme mobile broadband. We are talking 10 gigabit, up to 10 gigabit per second rates, as opposed to average of 5, 6 megabit today. Uh, so peak is about 14 megabit today. Uh, 100 megabit minimum available anytime. Today, it's more like one or two megabit uh, minimum on LTE. Uh, traffic, 10,000 times more traffic compared to what we have today. And we'll talk about why we're talking that. Latency, less than one millisecond. Today, it's about 15 millisecond, 10 to 15 millisecond. So that's a huge difference, and when, when you, uh, like, you load a video, you're running a video, and you see all of a sudden pause, hiccups, that's all the latency issues. With, gigabit, with 5G, it's not supposed to happen at all. So those, those are the specs. Uh, ultra reliability. In our landline days, 5.9 was a commonly known factor in telecom business. That if you don't have 5.9, you cannot launch it, period. That's what 5G is supposed to be. So it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, it has to be always connected, and uh, uh, you should not be dropping calls. That's where the zero uh, um, the mobility uh, uh, downtime comes in. So it could be anywhere, anytime, it should not drop. And that anywhere. brings it. What's that? Anywhere? Yeah, anywhere. That's what 5G requirement is. Whether deployment happens that way or not, <laughs> don't know. But the requirement is it should not drop anywhere. Because as you will see later on, 5G is supposed to be available for mission critical applications remotely anywhere. Yeah. Uh, 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 then 10 years battery. No, that's not for a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> we can do 10 years battery today with LTE. But there's a different uh, version of LTE that is used in IoT devices where the speeds are down to 200 kilobits per second or so, 
and those ones use very little power and they can last 10 year battery and uh, but they're still very expensive uh, uh, the phone will definitely benefit with the battery uh, and the reason is these devices the 5g is supposed to make it ultra low cost and uh, ultra low power consumption so phone in general will benefit from that in the overall battery life and all that but eventually battery technology also have to improve uh, but for typical IOT type applications, I mean, this will be pretty easy to achieve with 5G. One million devices per kilometer. That's probably half a square mile, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, the, uh, divide by nine. But anyway, 1, 000, 1 million mi uh, devices. Today on LTE, you can do a few thousand. That's about it. So that's a huge, huge factor. So, uh, and why do we need that? We'll talk about that in a uh, few minutes. So effectively, that's what 5G requirements are. What's happening with the deployments is, uh, I mean, the challenges of de deployment are there's so many spectrums available or not available uh, today, but maybe later. They're all spread out, and most of them are higher frequency uh, uh, spectrums, which means they cannot go too far. Today, LTE signals, they can go almost two miles with the uh, high bandwidth uh, above six gigahertz type of uh, spectrums, you can go maybe half a mile or e even less, maybe a few hundred feet, and that's about it. And that bandwidth, that uh, frequency cannot cross your walls. So you put it outside, it doesn't come into the building. So what will happen with 5G is they cannot solve all the problem with simply that spectrum. They will have to combine practically every technology available. LTE, 3G, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, 5, 4, whatever. Uh, whatever technology is available, they will all be integrated in some form or fashion, but meeting all these requirements that we talked about. Uh, that's the long-term plan. So initially what's happening is today when, I mean, earlier this week, I guess, when T-Mobile said they've turned on nationwide 5G network, all they did was use the frequency they were using on 3G, I think it was 600 megahertz, and they turn on 5G on that, the speeds are closer to 100 megabits, not in that range. They're 100 megabits, and they're not going as far as LTE, and basically they're calling it 5G, just like AT&T called it 5G evolution, and all they did was some enhancements on LTE to achieve that level of speeds, uh, but they're not getting it. Practically, I would say half of our phones have 5G is showing right now on AT&T but the speeds are still the same as LTE, in the LTE speeds. So it was just a gimmick, marketing gimmick, nothing more. And that's what T-Mobile is doing today. So, but that will change. It's going to change what is easier to deploy your existing spectrum, uh, uh, the 600, 800 megahertz, because that's available today. And they, uh, they can simply uh, switch around with LTE and 3G and all that and launch it. The true 5G with a millimeter wave is going to come in later. AT&T does have it, I think in 12 metro areas, but it's focused strictly on enterprise. Nobody else has access to it. So, so now, why do we need 5G? If, next, oh, sorry. What happened? There you go. Uh, next, one billion people, which is beyond current generation is going to be all mobile. Like sometimes people will joke, they'll be born with a phone in their hands. <laughs> so <laughs> they will not know anything beyond a uh, phone. Uh, just like the millennials don't know what floppy disk was. Uh, you show them what the hell is this? Is this like a, uh, some sort of uh, phone or something? <laughs> they just don't know. That's what might happen in the future. But if you look at the trend in 2014, there were 1.7 billion mobile subscriptions. 2019, 2.7, 1 billion gap in five years. Again, 2025 projection about uh, close to 3.5, 3.6. That's another billion upgrade. Think about 15, 20 years from now. We, uh, the internet, no internet is up close to 5 billion, projected to be down to 3.5 billion, and it may be practically zero person with, any, with no internet in 15, 20 years. And then you imagine the amount of data 
that will be flowing through this traffic and number of subscribers need to be supported. And as you know, demographically today, uh, there are a lot more people moving into uh, 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 I mean, suburban areas rather than staying in rural areas, which means the suburban traffic and the re demand for subscriptions and connections is going to increase significantly. <coughs> so having said that, look at device growth. This is a little old data, but still serves the purpose. I couldn't find the latest one. Uh, from 2017 through 22, we have 10% CAGR. But look at this blue line. This is IoT devices, 51%. Half of them will be IoT devices. And then a smartphone is staying pretty consistent through the whole period. One fourth of all devices will be smartphones. So between a smartphone and IoT devices, that's three fourths of all the devices out there. And that trend is continuing. Over time, if you look at PCs, drop to almost half. TVs is dropping, but then the number of TVs is also not growing that fast because people are using their iPads and smartphones uh, to watch. They just do AirPlay or whatever. Uh, tablets staying consistent. So tablets and phones are staying consistent. Everything else is dropping. Um, can you elaborate on what constitutes the uh, IoT devices as of today? Like what's, what's so you have you know, uh, from cell phone connectivity, industrial IoT mostly. So, so can we hold that question and, and we, we'll talk later? I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. OK. So um, yeah, so the idea is that the devices, the phone and IoT will be uh, the uh, main uh, devices that you'll be worrying about in the future. Uh, and others are practically going to be just sitting there in, in some archive. And uh, kids born now will say, what the hell is the laptop about? <laughs> uh, then you look at traffic. So with all those device increasing, today, uh, 2019, you have roughly 200 exabytes of data per month floating around on the um, um, mobile networks, 26% uh, CAGR. And again, look, smartphone data is growing from 17 to 22, from 18% to 44, about two and a half times in just five years from here. Uh, 2019 is about 25%, so that's uh, roughly 1.7, 1.8 times. TV data decreased. PC is decreased. M2M doubled. Tablets flat, practically. Uh, and so if you look at the whole thing, it's all the messages, tablets, uh, uh, smartphones, and M2M devices. That's where the future growth is. And uh, to handle so many connections and so much data, 5G with this bandwidth availability is going to be the key. Then look at data. What is the t What constitutes the data? Uh, 2019 today, 63% is video. 25, 76% video. By the way, these slides will be sent to all of you by Rob, so you don't need to take a bunch of pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and what is causing video to grow? Practically everything online has some sort of video embedded in there. Uh, whether it's an advertisement, a YouTube uh, link, or whatever, but there's some sort of video involved in there. People have are cutting their cord. They're moving to OTT all the time. Uh, you're sitting around somewhere. Uh, you're just watching your uh, video on the phone, whether it's YouTube or something else, or your family videos. You're watching video. Video is everywhere. So it's 76% by 2025. Just fast forward 10, 20 years from now. I mean, who knows? Could be 90, 95%. I don't know. So the uh, video is the biggest driver of this. And the next one is social networking. So basically social, the human nature being social, and the video as part of that and otherwise together are covering practically 90% of all the data. So having said that, what is so special about 5G? Today's technology should be able to handle a lot of that, because that's what general people think. But the issue is, if you look at this is the bandwidth, less than one megabit, and all the way to greater than one gigabit, and then latency. Given that today is LTE, like I said, the latency is 10 to 15 milliseconds, and um, the bandwidth is around 5, 6 megabit per second, which means we are limited to about here. So we can cover these applications, maybe a little bit of this and a little bit of this. We do the video streaming today, but we 
cannot cover a lot of these things. Uh, and that's where 5G will be needed because you need to have latency in that range and bandwidth up here. So that includes autonomous driving. Yes, the whole autonomous driving is coming, whether it's five years, 10 years, don't know. And we look at Tesla today, is, uh, uh, what, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar, the five levels of autonomous driving. Uh, one, two is fairly common, three is kind of there, four is where Tesla and Waymo are, five is still missing. And the reason five is missing is V2V communication. That requires an infrastructure across every road out there, highway road, whatever, where the cars can communicate and know the infrastructure, where things are, what's happening, and communicate. And so it will have to wait for that to happen. And that requires government in, uh, investments. So the point is, so autonomous driving, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, how many of you experienced VR? I mean, AR is on the phone. I call it gimmick, so I, I don't count that AR. <laughs> VR, how many of you have experienced? Oh, quite a few. Uh, try it. It's, it's real fun. And you really get immersed and lost, and you forget where you are. So for happiness, that's the one way to go. <laughs> yeah. That will come after the funding. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it doesn't take that much. Yeah. You can do the development pretty quick on that. But anyway, uh, so that uh, on AR is still premature. We are probably three years away from having an AR that is in this kind of form factor. And Magic Leap is early in this, but to what you really need for AR to be popular is something like this, and then be able to do what you need to do. VR and AR are complementary. People always confuse that VR is for consumer gaming entertainment, AR is for enterprise. That's not true. <coughs> VR is used in enterprise a lot. The thing is VR is more for indoor uh, work. AR can be indoor or outdoor, is but more contextual. But it does require a lot of data. In VR today, you need about, uh, I think, 25 to 30 uh, uh, megabit per second minimum speed. And then uh, the amount of data floating uh, for like a five minute segment is in like 30 gigabit or something like that. It's a pretty high number. Uh, and the biggest thing is tactile internet. What tactile internet is, always reliable, zero, practically zero latency, uh, and uh, uh, communication vehicle like our internet. Uh, not where you're sitting and loading, loading, loading. Uh, it should be like, boom, it's there. And, that internet, from infrastructure perspective, then could be used for robotic surgeries, telemedicine, telesurgeries, and those kind of things. Could, and those are mission critical uh, things that have to happen. One little lag, and the person could die on the other end. So, so that's where the tactile internet is critical. So to enable everything practically in this area, that's what you need 5G for. And that's what is special about 5G. There's nothing else that can enable. And 5G is not the holy grail. There will be 6G and 7G later on. We may or may not be alive then. <laughs> I mean, typically these are oh, typically these are 10-year cycle. Once the deployment starts to the deployment next generation, is about 10-year cycle. So is it hyper reality? If you think about 2G, 3G, 4G all combined, and this is like four years ago. Look where we were. And four year, in just two years, it has gone almost triple. It was well, about five, seven uh, here, and this is a 30. It's almost four times in just four years. And this is 3G, 3G, 4G. Now, 2G started practically as that. It's not available as cellular anymore. It's still used for IoT because the way IoT, many of the IoT devices do not need low, uh, high bandwidth. So 2G is still there, but 3G is dying. 4G is still being deployed in many parts of the world, but it, it's, it's, uh, it will start slowing down. So overall, 4G does continue to grow a little bit, but primarily because many countries like Africa and parts of India and China don't have that yet. But two th the 5G, this is the first year. And it's just starting, but if you just look at 4G LTE curve, 5G is bound to follow even more, given the amount of devices and data that we have to support. Question. 
So th there was a consumer survey conducted by, I think, GSMA. And they asked a question, one bunch of questions to the consumers. What would they like to see in the next generation technology? Number one, 54%, improved mobile data speeds. So even with current speeds of 6, 7 megabits or 15 megabits, we are not happy. So that's number one. Number two, improved mobile service coverage. We don't want any drop calls. Uh, innovative new services like Ubers and Lyfts of the world, but futuristic. So and on and on. But basically, 5G is fulfilling all of those needs. So it's not a hype. And given that this fills needs, people are going to be innovative and find ways to leverage 5G to offer all kinds of services. And then IoT devices. So just look at the growth curve from 2015 through projection. And even like 19 is from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that. It's about 1.4, 1.3. Uh, the three categories here, the legacy 2G devices. These are devices that may be sitting on like oil pipelines or railway tracks, which just need to send a little bit of data. OK, there's a vibration, or there's a temperature change. And then it will go silent for a long time. Those don't need much bandwidth. So 2G is still fine for those. And, and 2G can go very far. Uh, it can go miles with 2G data, uh, I mean 2G signal. And then massive IoT and uh, narrow band IoT or category M, that's LTE. These are also low bandwidth, 200 megabit, 200 kilobit kind of speeds. And they are low power technologies uh, still within the LTE uh, protocol. Uh, but uh, because of that low power and uh, low bandwidth, they can, the battery can last like 10 years. Uh, so th that's what that one is. Now, that one will continue to grow because there are a lot of applications that need that. They just chip a little bit, and then they're quiet for a while. So, uh, but uh, they, they need the higher battery. But broadband IoT and critical IoT, this is where uh, the need comes in, like uh, automotive is one, industrial uh, uh, manufacturing, where all the machines and robots are running and jump throwing all this data uh, uh, that needs to be processed in real time. So that's where 5G will come in. But if you look at the growth curve for this, is much uh, higher than the, uh, the category M. So altogether, we don't think 5G is a hype. It's a reality. There's just a lot of things that need to happen that we know today. And we just don't know what else could need to happen. So just to put this in, in a quantitative form, so the 8 billion mobile subscriptions today. Now, some of them are duplicates in the sense like people have two lines where there's still one person. So in reality, there are about 5.9 unique subscribers to the services. 6.2 billion of those are global mobile uh, broadband subscription. That's LTE and those kind of things. So more than 70% of these are on smartphones. Uh, and I think the biggest missing piece in smartphones here is Africa and India. Uh, and they don't have very many smartphones yet. All this coming. And then, so this is today. When 5G is launched six years from now, I mean, it's launching this year. Six years from now, 2.6 billion subscriptions. These are growing at 3% per year. So 6.2 may end up being maybe 7.2, 7.3, something like that billion. Out of that, 2.6, which is about 40%, will be 5G. So it's happening. It's, uh, you will see it pretty soon. So where are we in deployment? So this is the first year that 5G is truly being deployed, although at late 18, there was some noise by AT&T, Verizon, and all that. And US made a lot of noise that we'll do it. And they kind of fell behind a little bit. And uh, eventually, Verizon deployed the first, I think, few metros in the US uh, to claim that we were the first in the world. But then uh, all together to date, 33 operators in 18 countries have deployed uh, 5G this year. Uh, that covers about 8% of all mobile connections. Uh, 77 additional operators have announced that they'll be deploying over the next 12 months or so. Altogether, there are just over 800 operators in the world. So there's a long way to go. Uh, 
initial deployments, they are mostly in urban centers like San Francisco, San Jose, like more dense areas. Basically, Bay Area is covered in that. Uh, rural is not there yet. And when you see these numbers down here, Korea covered 86%, and people say, geez, that's really fast. Well, the uh, uh, fun thing there is, once you deploy Seoul, you covered 50% of the population. <laughs> and you have two or a couple of more cities, you're done. So uh, SK Telecom and Korea Telecom, they were the first one to deploy practically all of uh, Seoul and some more. And that's how they have 86% coverage in, uh, by 2021. Uh, Japan, same story. US, kind of same story. But then there are four operators. And like Mobile is saying, T-Mobile is saying, we deployed 100%. That's not true. It's just marketing gimmick. AT&T is 12 cities right now. Verizon is, I think, 18 cities. Uh, so it's happening slowly, slowly. But next year will be big. You will see practically all across the US, at least in urban areas, you will have 5G. Uh, this thing is not working anymore. So coming to economic value, how are we doing on time? OK, we still got that. So company coming to economic value, you need $1 trillion of capex over a seven, eight year period. 300 billion of that is already in deployment now. Over, it's already happening until 2021. And those are the first 77 plus about 100 operators, 110 operators. Then there's an additional $700 billion capex to be deployed before you can call 5G fairly well deployed. And then innovations will continue on top of that. So what does that provide the operators? They need revenue source. And based on GSMA survey, enterprise is going to be the first taker of these services. So whatever 5G enables, enterprise will be the first set of customers. And that's why operators are focusing on offering the services to enterprise first and then worry about consumers. So AT&T's first millimeter wave deployment was focused strictly on enterprise. And they're about to turn on their low bandwidth, uh, low frequency deployment soon. That will be for consumers. Uh, so operators generate about $1 trillion, this is worldwide, about $1 trillion in revenue every year. And it grows a little bit. Um, and the mobile ecosystem contribution, what that means is the equipment vendors, tower, and other such suppliers to the operators. They generate another $1.1 trillion contribution to the GDP. The mobile technology and services, that's where the Ubers and all those kind of services and other such services fall. 18, it was $3.9 trillion of the GDP. And 23 is $4.8 trillion. Uh, and that is primarily because the productivity increases and the overall benefits the companies get out of it or people get out of it. So overall GDP contribution is pretty high. 15 years from now, 5G will be contributing $2.2 trillion. So if you assume that continues to grow over next, say, 10 more years from there, you're looking at maybe $6 trillion there. 2.2, roughly 40% is coming from 5G. OK, let's not now talk about application services. I've got 10 more minutes, so we'll, I'll try to rush through it. <laughs> You'll have the slides. You can read them. Fixed wireless is probably the first application, and that's what AT&T did with the millimeter wave. What that is is replacing your Comcast of the world. The, you don't need the fiber anymore. At gigabit per second or more speeds, because with the fixed wireless, you can provide that. You can point the antennas in certain directions and just have that uh, uh, high bandwidth uh, going through. Uh, so that is the easiest deployment to make. You find that you can put on uh, electric, the light, uh, street light towers. You can put anywhere and then have them focused at home. Obviously, home is going to need a, uh, some sort of modem to receive that. So actually, HTC launched uh, a 5G router uh, earlier this year, uh, shipping right now by five, six different operators, including Sprint. You can put that at home, and once you have that, you just connect directly. You don't need any Comcast or anything. Uh, and internally, you'll have the Wi-Fi. And that router could potentially become the home hub uh, uh, that can do all the functions like Alexa and Google Home and all those things, and much more, control your home lighting and all kind of things. So that's coming. I mean, we already have it. Uh, it's coming. Uh, 
augmented virtual reality we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, smart homes, device equipment. Today, all the smart devices that you have put in your home, practically all of them are connected to your Wi-Fi or maybe Bluetooth. And then it gets uh, aggregated and out uh, to the internet through whatever internet connection you have. With the low cost, low power requirements of 5G and the high bandwidth and all that, you can have a 5G built into these devices. And then these devices are talking straight to the cloud or maybe an edge uh, cloud, edge, some sort of edge device. And that edge device then can aggregate and do whatever needs to be done. So all the processing, access, everything can happen in the cloud or the edge. And uh, you don't need a bunch of different devices at home. You just have all these devices and your smartphone or whatever is your controller. You just interact directly with the cloud. You can get rid of all the clutter, cable clutter in your home. And of course, when the AI ML comes in, uh, incorporated behind those, you can have tons of data about your own home, your own behavior, and everything, and potentially fix your habits. <laughs> uh, agriculture, smart farming systems. So uh, there are companies already working on devices or have launched some of the devices where they use either LTE or some sort of fixed connectivity through satellite. They scan the farm, so uh, like for example, uh, uh, the tractor is going through the farm, is checking how the crop is, where do you need to put more fertilizer, pesticide, water, and what's happening, uh, and talk to the cloud, figure out the mm, environment and things like that, and take actions. With 5G, it becomes even simpler, because now you can have it out in the cloud again, and high connectivity, you don't need to uh, uh, worry about the cost of deploying all this communication equipment, because they're also cheap now at that point. And you can do all that. Uh, there is a company I came across. They have a little um, uh, that iRobot type of device sitting in front of the tractor. And as the tractor is going, spreading the fertilizer, it controls how much fertilizer to put at what part of the farm. So constantly is changing the amount of fertilizer being put in. Uh, because it's scanning just like the uh, car cameras or LIDARs do. It's scanning everything and figuring out what's happening, sensing the crowd. So with 5G, it all becomes pretty easy. Now you can go farther out and not have to depend on satellite communication anymore for these kind of things, I mean. Uh, retail commerce, again, uh, I'm sure a lot of you might have gone to Amazon Go store. If not, Amazon Go basically, there's a, you have the Amazon's app. Uh, Amazon Go app on the phone. Uh, you go in, you scan, the, you activate it, scan the code that comes in in your entry point. Then you go in, and you walk through the store, pick whatever you want, and just walk out. You don't need to talk to anybody, pay anybody. Uh, and because uh, once you scan, it's tracking you through the whole store. And when you pick up the item, the shelf has the knowledge of uh, where things are uh, and how much amount has been picked up and all that, and keeps track as you walk out. Your receipt shows up on the phone. This is what you purchased, uh, and you're out. That's just a precursor of what's coming. Uh, there's a company just started deploying. It's more like an 18-wheeler truck type of stores at street corners. You can just walk in, walk out. There's absolutely nobody in the store. It's tracking you through their communication network, whatever they have set up, and cameras, and identifying you who you are. You don't need ID or anything. Just walk in. It's identifying who you are. And then based on that, you have to have an account. It will figure out where to charge, and you pick up the item, keep going. So it's coming. And that will have big impact on a lot of brick and mortars, and uh, like small shops in the corner and all that. We'll see. Uh, manufacturing, I mean, I mean, you can imagine every machine, every key critical component of the machine connected directly to 5G. Uh, or some sort of 5G network device, I mean, uh, channel, and maintaining real-time visibility on every machine, supply chain, productivity, the defects, manufacturing, just whole AI sitting behind it, highlighting. It automates the factory big time. Uh, I remember 1992, I was in Japan, and I saw a Futaba factory which produced 76% of world's glass for its retail displays. Five people in that factory, that's it. They were operating only five people. The whole thing was robotic. And now, and that was like all in the, in the building. Now you can have 5G control 
and probably way more information available. Uh, businesses, I mean, remote workers, 3D collaboration, VR, AR, and all that, that will happen. Healthcare is going to benefit in a big way. Uh, remote doctors, so you don't need to visit the doctor's office. You will have technologies and potentially sensors available at home where doctors can simply guide you what you need to do so they can diagnose you uh, over their links and, and help you out. They will have tele-robotic surgeries. So surgeon could be sitting in Stanford, patient could be out there in China somewhere, and they could be doing actual surgery from here. And if you have the lag, patient is dead. So it's very critical. Uh, your wearables, all that like AirPods and your um, um, watches and wristbands and all that, they can all be directly connected to 5G, collecting all the data and doing processing in the cloud and then telling you on the fly what you're doing wrong, what you need to do more, how you behave, how you improve your health, exercise, whatever. So a lot of that can happen. Today, only way is through the phone. What if you don't have a phone? Many of us don't want to carry phone with us while going and exercise, uh, but you still need the device. Uh, telemedicine, we talked about. Sorry, I missed that. Smart cities. Uh, there's a lot of automation in the cities because cities are still old bureaucratic systems. They're not much of an automation. But it, it's some of the projections that 5G is projected to generate $160 billion in smart city shave, savings. And what that means is keeping track of, like, rain is coming. What needs to happen? If rain happened, sensors that tell them where the water flow is, where the trouble is happening. Uh, same thing about electricity and all the basically utilities thing. And there are a lot of street cameras that can help them detect traffic patterns, how to improve the traffic, and all kind of other things. Uh, first responder system in emergency and things like that. Uh, so a lot of that. And the smart transportation. So Deloitte do, did a study that with 5G and self-driving cars, emissions will reduce by 40 to 90% travel times by 40% and travel delays by 20%, we all can use it here in the Bay Area for sure. <laughs> and then Innocenter, another one said, it'll save 21,700 lives and $447 billion per year. So this is all impact of 5, 2G that I was talking, sorry, 5G that I was talking about. And then the smart camera sensors and all that. A smart grid could generate $1.8 trillion for the US economy, saving consumers hundreds of dollars. Uh, so this is my last slide. Uh, list never ends. This is just what people are talking about you can think of today. A lot more will happen. It's just getting started. This is year one. Uh, predictions are that next year will be big, 5G, but in a, in a big way for video, primarily. Uh, by 2026, there will be more than 64 billion IoT devices connected. Uh, in home, out home, doesn't matter, um, all together. And with full rollout, uh, IoT will be basically uh, ruling the world. It's already projected 51% in 2022. Uh, by, I mean, 10 years from now, who knows what percentage. So that's my presentation. Thanks. I'm open to questions. So your first question, she asked in the middle. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, we want to use this microphone. It's not amplified. It's recorded. That way, we'll have contact with the question and answer for a video. So, okay. thank you very much. Uh, if the chorus does not amplify. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, it might be really helpful if you went to the last slide, then I'll just pause it on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's just been a lot of talk about uh, about the administration maybe slowing down or attempting to slow down some of the uh, progress uh, with Chinese tech companies regarding 5G. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think administration is slowing it down. Uh, the, the challenge is the capex. I mean, you can twist the story any way. At the end of the day, is the trillion dollar capex that I talked about. That's the major thing. I mean, Huawei is new in the game when it comes to these technologies. Ericsson, Nokia, I mean, uh, Samsung, they all have those technologies today. And all the deployments today are using those technologies. So it's not like Huawei is superior to them. They may be the same, but then there people have doubts about their technology. So technology is there. It's the capex. And then the spectrum. The spectrum is limited. And it's so fragmented, it all needs to be somehow brought together to offer the, to meet the 5G standards. 
It's just not there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 can you pass it into her? She had a question. I just want to answer her question. <laughs> um, so very good presentation. Thank you. Um, however, I'm really sad. Uh-oh. After seeing the numbers. Can you make her happy? <laughs> um, and I will tell you why. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I've worked on electromagnetic radiation health effects for over seven plus years. Mm -hmm. I've met more than 200 cancer patients who live close to cell phone towers, and mm -hmm. this is from 2009 to 2014 time period. Uh, my dad himself had health problems. I was involved in convincing the government of India to reduce the guidelines to one tenth in 2012. And there are so many health problems. I've been talking with researchers around the world. There's a bio-initiated report that 2,000 research studies that say there are health problems. And 5G is going to make it worse. <laughs> there was 2G, then there was 3G, there was 4G came in. 5G is going to make things worse. And there are two things that you said. One of them I agree, and one of them I don't. Okay. And I'll tell you just not nothing uh, personal here. The first thing was there will be one billion people, or one billion uh, people who will be born with mobile. But to be honest, I don't know how many of them will be normal. <laughs> and the other, that's something that I don't agree with. And what I do agree with you is that when you said 5G will come, 6G will come, maybe we'll, we will not probably, you will, like, you know, people will not be alive by then. And you're right, we will not be alive by then. Mm -hmm. So it's very good technology. I have my cell phone as well. I'm not against technology. I'm very much a part of technology. Uh, I, have, uh, I love technology. But this, I mean, at the end of the day, all of this at what cost? It's, it's good to have faster stuff, but at what cost? Yeah. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I've seen, again, and these health problems, they don't happen in one day or two. Right? It's OK, not, I, I think I got your message. Let, so. let, let me answer that, and so because I just yes. need time. So if you, from a technology perspective, if you look at 1G all the way now, uh, one thing you need to ensure, see that the power of the radiation that is emitted has gone down significantly. And 5G is even lower. Just when I said the very low power consumption, that's the battery power. When the battery goes down, the signal power also goes down. So that's one uh, that's going to help. And as far as I understand, there have been a lot of concerns about this uh, radiation and health and all that. But at the end of the day, when you look at overall percentage, I mean, I'm not against, I, I'm not offending you or anything, I hope. But when you look at like auto accidents. How many auto accidents per million people versus uh, people affected with a cell phone? Because whatever reports are there, uh, I mean, I don't know about Indian numbers, but in the US, every number that came out, they basically said, maybe some effect, but uh, not clear. So there are lots of research. I mean, it's a trillion dollar industry, as you pointed out. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with lobbying. It took 40 years for the tobacco industry to say that you know smoking is injurious to health. In this case, people will not even live for 40 years with the kind of radiation. There's so many health problems already that are happening. The way you're saying the number of cell phones and cell phone towers is increasing, the number of cancer cases, the number of miscarriages is also increasing. I have 15 billionaires who have asked me to do radiation measurements for them. Five of them are telecom owners. Mm -hmm. Why? No. I mean, I, I can answer all the questions, but I, I, I see what you're saying. So there's a huge issue here, and I think we are, in, so being in Silicon Valley, we, are, we have a responsibility to, even though, like, you know, the world kind of looks up to Silicon Valley for technology, but then we also need to be aware of the health implications, the ethical values here. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to consider these when we design technology. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate your point. I think we need to I'll give a chance to other okay. people. Yeah, I appreciate your point. Yeah. So I want to know about the IoT device. Can you compare to it? Can you put this closer? Can you compare between? Okay. So can you compare between MB IoT and 5D? Like which one would be good for IoT device? It depends on the device. The NB IoT is very low uh, bandwidth. You're, you're talking like two kilobits per second to 120, uh, 200 kilobit per second max. 5G is much much higher. So it depends on the type of device. If device is rarely used, and it just emits the uh, signal every uh, once in a while. You're still okay with 2G, 3G, but then when you look at the cost uh, uh, in terms of power and uh, uh, the life it needs to endure and all that, 5G will eventually will be good. But there's no point in replacing those devices today with 5G because that can go on for a long time. Yeah. Next question. <coughs> 
Hi, thank you for your presentation. Thanks. I actually have two questions. One is about security, which we will always worry about. Do you see uh, security being a greater or lesser concern as far as 5G is concerned, or does it really matter? And then the second question is about the rollout in other parts of the world that may not have 4G right now. Will, will they bypass 4G and go right to 5G, or is it going to be an iteration like it is in other parts? Of the world? It depends on cost. So let me first answer your first part, security mm -hmm. one. So the standards do require uh, certain security standards, and from what I'm reading, People are saying that 5G will be a very, very secure network. But at the same time, the hackers, they're always ahead of you. You can never guarantee security once you get digital. So, so not much you can do on that one. <laughs> but it definitely be better than what it is now. Uh, with regards to deployment in the countries that don't have 4G, yeah, they can jump. There's nothing that stops them from jumping. Uh, uh, the key is the uh, spectrum. Do they have the spectrum available to do what needs to be done here? So. I mean, 5G at the end of the day is mostly a software. It's not that much of a hardware. I mean, LTE stations uh, uh, with a radio change and software change can operate as a 5G. Uh, uh, I mean, it's expensive, and uh, the spectrum is a big deal. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. yeah um, hi. Can you talk just a little bit more? Oh, oh, sorry. OK. Uh -huh. um, so the question has to do about the physical infrastructure we're going to see over time. Um, I'm actually old enough to have financed one of Marty Cooper's companies, <laughs> okay. which was a cell phone tower company. Uh -huh. So we know there's going to be towers, but the millimeter wave, as I understand, is going to require much more density. And you spoke about light towers a little bit, but can you give us a little more <laughs> flesh out on that? It's interesting you bring that up. So about three months, four months ago, I read about a lawsuit up here in Peninsula somewhere uh, against AT&T. They wanted to put a 5G tower, uh, like a very wooded area, uh, uh, to get the signals going. It, it was not like tall woods, just lower woods, but enough to hide the tower. And somebody in the neighborhood filed a lawsuit. <laughs> now at and cannot go in that area <laughs> until unless they have alternate technology. So that's a big challenge, especially in the US. You go outside the US, people don't care. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, I was in India about two years ago. and. Uh, my mother, she lives alone, and uh, we have like a huge roof in the back. And somebody said, just put, get them to put a tower. They'll pay you like 100,000 rupees a month uh, for nothing. Just put the tower. And I said, that looks ugly. So what? You're getting 100,000 rupees, <laughs> which is about uh, like, uh, what, $1,000, uh, $1,300. So that's the thing. When you go to other countries, there are no such regulations. But US is just so different. It's going to be a challenge here. Uh, but if you put on like the street light um, uh, poles right on top, these are small. They are not uh, very big ones. So you can put there. People won't notice. It may work. But the moment you go to neighborhoods, it's going to be a problem. And unless, I guess, the uh, AT&T or Verizon, they start enticing people and saying, hey, here, take some money. I will <laughs> just put it on. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge. We have to see how it goes. And other thing is with 5G, you're integrating a bunch of different technologies, LTE, 3G, Wi-Fi, and all that. Those already exist. So if you can put 5G in a places where you can integrate to that without uh, uh, causing those kind of problems, it may be possible. We'll see. Yeah. So hey, like <clears throat> there are incredible opportunities uh, coming with 5G. I have two questions. Firstly, where do you see the low-hanging fruit you know, companies are looking to get into something that's going to take advantage of you know, this, this 5G boom? Uh, that's the first question, where you see the you know, biggest opportunities. And secondly, as a VC, what is it that you're looking for in terms of you know, what excites you and excites your partners that makes you uh, want to open the wall? OK. Yeah, so the biggest opportunity in 5G, of course, is the equipment and components and all that that you can, I mean, equipment is mostly there today. Uh, you can definitely improve in the components and all that. but. For Silicon Valley, the way it is today, the biggest opportunity is to create something better than Ubers and Lyfts and uh, Airbnbs of the world. Come up with services, applications that can really uh, uh, solve real uh, problems of consumers and enterprises 
that are not solvable today because of infrastructure. So th that's where the biggest one is. From my perspective in particular, I work for HTC and our holy grail is VR AR. So get me the use cases for VR AR that can leverage 5G and AI. Yeah. Yeah. And from VC's perspective, it's primarily the application services you can generate off 5G. Yeah. All right, next question. So I was just curious. You mentioned that um, the LTE towers can be retrofitted and you know 5G be deployed. So where is that one trillion capital expenditure coming from? Because the 5G is a small cell versus a large cell. So not every LTE tower is like one-on-one -on -one type of thing. LTE towers can go. I think it's almost two miles. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have one tower, you cover practically two-mile radius, one and a half two-mile radius. With 5G, you're looking at half mile or less. So more towers. You will have to put in a lot more towers. Uh, and also, the architecture may change. Like I remember when I was at SK Telecom, when LTE was deployed in 2009 in uh, uh, Seoul, what they did was instead of putting the whole base station at the tower, they pulled all the base stations into the cloud. And the, the tower was basically just the antenna. So now when 5G comes, they can simply throw the antenna away, put the new one, and update the software in the cloud. We're done. So uh, and, and that way they can make the, it's a lot cheaper to put an antenna than the whole base station and the new structure and all that. That's true, but that's the problem. Okay. This is the problem. Question, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the presentation. Why does health always get the last seat? That's my problem. <laughs> No, it's not last, but uh, yeah. Th th thanks for the presentation. My question is around the end user devices in mm -hmm. the 5G space. So I recently read something about Qualcomm building a chipset for Apple. So could you highlight that? Because that was missing from your presentation. Uh, so the so availability of the end user devices and the price point. OK, so I purposely didn't go into that part because the topic was, will it change everything? Uh, the Qualcomm was building 5G chip, and I think initially it may use, but app, if you might have read, Apple bought Intel's 5G chip division. So, uh, sorry, yeah, Apple bought Intel's 5G chip division. So Apple is going to have its own 5G chips whenever they're ready. Uh, maybe initially they use Qualcomm, maybe not. In terms of what's available, today, I just checked yesterday, there were like 21 5G devices available now, not in the US. US has only two. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Samsung Galaxy is the most high profile brand. Huawei has it, LG, um, mm, Lenovo, Xiaomi, and Oppo. So, but those are mostly selling outside. Uh, Samsung and uh, is it Oppo or OnePlus? Those two are the ones selling here in the US. Uh, I mean, with the T Mobile launch, they started there. Uh, and uh, ATT Verizon are put, uh, shipping those. And the price point? They're roughly same as today. Same? Yeah, roughly same. Yeah. I mean, 5G actually makes it a little cheaper yeah. <laughs> from a communication part of it, but they add more features, so price point won't change much. It may go up, not down. Yeah. <laughs> right. Next question. Uh, hi. Um, <clears throat> this is with respect to low latency applications. You said, um, you know, particularly below 10 milliseconds, like tactile internet or uh, augmented reality. Looks like that is possible with the edge networks. Mm -hmm. Once you think in terms of cloud or internet, the current latencies are going to be there anyway because the traffic need to travel through core networks, you know, existing infrastructure. How does it uh, differ from existing 4G? So that's where edge computing is going to become really big. Yeah, but the applications within the edge, they can communicate very fast. But is it possible across the If it's a direct 5G link, yes. Or if it's direct 5G link, yes. So if you phone to tower, that one millisecond is uh, given. I mean, you cannot get over the latency provided by the hard in the wireline infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So if basically, you basically one example we are giving, right? You know, a physician, a, a surgeon uh, in one country and a patient in another country. Such a thing. No, is those are possible because what happens that you you're going to edge network. And then from edge, through the fiber channel, through the core network, you're not. You that is going to be very high latency. Any core, right? It is on the order of uh, at least 50 milliseconds from there. Right. Uh, it is. Uh, but the uh, technology is as part of 5G, there are certain required technology that need to be implemented 
to ensure that. And it, this telerobotics, telesurgery is not coming in within the next two, three years. It's probably 10 years out. But that's part of the standard what needs to be done to achieve those across the whole end-to-end -end, uh, operation, yeah. I don't want to push this question if it's not a subject area that you feel comfortable answering, but I thought this scientist's question was very well articulated, and I would like to see it not taken offline. Um, I would love to hear your expertise in addressing what so, she asks. No, the, the question what you ask is a valid question, but again, I'm not an expert in this area. All I can speak to is what I learned when I was in SK Telecom. Uh, at that point, there was a lot of studies that came out. And yes, there have been some cases, but they could never be with certainty be identified they were strictly because of phone being held up here uh, near the ear or through cell signal. But every home with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all that, there's so many signals. You cannot, I mean, the studies could not pinpoint that it was strictly the cell, not the other wi wireless technologies. So I don't want to be a nuisance here. Yeah. By no means I respect you for your work, and I don't want to be a nuisance. But Health is important here. Of course. And exactly the problem, I worked on this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the problem is obviously telecom companies, they are not experts in health, but they are the ones who are making the standards. The government standards that we have throughout the world, I see an ARP is utilized by 90% of the countries, US adopts 90 of the FCC guidelines. Those guidelines are based on six minutes per day of exposure. They were started in 1998. Mm -hmm. 1998. Even as of today, we are offering the same guidelines. So the radiation guidelines that we have according to the government is for six minutes per day with a safety factor three to four. So it says only safe for 18 to 24 minutes. We are adopting it for 24 seven round the clock and from health point of view, it's absolutely bad. The studies that you're saying, the, again, the problem is the standards are being set by telecom companies, device manufacturers, who have no knowledge about healthcare, exactly, you just pointed out. Mm -hmm. we got, we got a, a question. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, when you mentioned like 18 cities in the US have it, by where it's in, et cetera, uh, these are sub-6 gigahertz networks, right? These are not millimeter wave. Uh, the Verizon is a mix. The 18 in Verizon is a mix. Some are sub-6, some are... Uh, 2020, we are not going to see like a massive 5G deployment in terms of millimeter wave. It's just going to be 5G uh, so and Initially, it's going to be the sub-6, and then later on will come the millimeter. Next year, you will see a big mix of, from every operator. The, the challenge is they don't have enough spectrum for everything. So they're going to focus millimeter wave on the enterprise uh, access and uh, applications, and the sub-6. Uh, on consumers. I see. So with sub six, like users or the end users won't see a big difference. Ah, uh, they will see. Uh, they will see 100, 200 mega, megabits per second versus uh, five, six. Yeah. That's, that's still much better. Twenty times. <laughs> yeah, 18, 20 times. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not technical, but when I think of 5G, I think, okay, this is the next step after 4G, not necessarily, you know, 2G could go farther than 3G. That doesn't make sense to me, right? So, from what I understand, 5G is really unification of existing technologies plus software on top. Is that about what 5G is? In a non-technical way, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, so my, my, my question is, you know, unification of data, of, of, of you know, hardware, software, et cetera, seems like it's a trend that's continuing, right? And so, uh, kind of a weird question, but once you have all this data uh, unified um, and all this hardware unified, mm -hmm. how do you address really who who controls that? You know, who sets the parameters for what 5G is? Could I go put four different pieces together and call that 6G? Because 6G is well, 6G well, nobody know. knows. Nobody right. knows what 6, 6G work has just started. So probably first part, first meeting might have been just a party, nothing else. So we don't know what 6G will be. In terms of 5G, who controls data? That's the same question that we asked today on 4G, uh, LTE, or even cloud in general. Who controls the data? So, I mean, you have, say, Android phone or iOS phone, all the data that is passing through, we don't have 100% guarantee who is controlling the data. Right. At the end of the day, it's up to us to give that access or not. I mean, you get these pop-ups saying, 
Do you accept, accept privacy, blah, 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 blah. Who's going to read those 20 pages of, sorry, Roger, legal work? <laughs> but you just say, OK, go. <laughs> and the, the, it comes down to that. And when the lawsuits happen, then the people basically start questioning. I never read it. And now what? So, so it's hard to answer, but uh, that's a challenge that I think only some sort of regulation in terms of privacy controls and all that can help. California, I think, just announced uh, two, three weeks ago some very strong uh, privacy uh, laws, almost as good as GDPR in uh, Europe. Uh, let's see if that helps any. But right now, we don't have much control on the data, what happens. Thank you. That's a big problem. Yeah. Next question. Hey, so. I'm not sure. Are you familiar with rare earth goods? Which one? Rare earth goods. Have you heard of these before? Uh, hard, hard yeah. term, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. So, in like pretty much every smart device, right, there's going to be rare earth goods, even though they're actually very common. Ironically, I don't know what to call them that, but it's the term. So, <coughs> there's a giant, <coughs> excuse me, there's a giant area called the Clarion Clipperton Zone um, mm -hmm. off between Mexico and Hawaii. Can you put the speaker? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a giant zone called the Clarion Clipperton Zone mm -hmm. uh, in between Mexico and Hawaii, mm -hmm. and it. Some people estimate its market value is probably about 12 to 18 trillion dollars mm -hmm. because it contains hundreds and hundreds of square miles of all these rare earth goods. So the reliance on five. Are you, are you repeating the uh, Ryan uh, series from Amazon? No, no, no. John no, no. Ryan. <laughs> oh, Jim Ryan. Six, Sorry. 60 minutes. That's right. Talk about it. That sources, whole yeah. trend near Venezuela, a multi trillion dollar thing. No, I mean, there's dozens of verified <laughs> okay. sources on Sorry. this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, New York Times. 60 minutes you need. Okay. Um, but anyways, I'm just curious what the reliance is because China owns a lot of seats at this table. U.S. zero so far. Litigators are arguing on Wall Street or D.C. whether to even have a spot here. But I'm just kind of curious what 5G's role is with like a zone like this or the reliance on, um, on their rare earth goods because the prices of electronics are dependent on these types of things. And if China and other countries control this, what the cost of the devices to consumers would be Mm -hmm. relying on who owns these types of territories? Uh, I don't know much uh, about that side. I, sorry, I can't answer that question. Oh, okay. But it, it's, it's like lithium, uh, uh, right now, the lithium batteries. Yeah. Uh, Chile is the one of the biggest producer of that. And uh, China also has a lot of it. But they are everywhere. I mean, all the car, electric cars are dependent on that. Yeah. So um, it's, it's all politics that will one day will hopefully take care of these issues. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer Probably to that. further in the future, but I was yeah. just curious if it impacted it now or... No, I, yeah. I mean, there, I, there are several other rare earth materials that are used in uh, component manufacturing for electronics and all that. Mm -hmm. And they're limited to certain zones. But uh, like I think I heard there was something in Antarctica where they uh, take it out from. But there's a treaty among all the countries how to share it. Uh, there is, yeah. Yeah, so hopefully something like that will happen. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Next question. Hi, um, I think it was mind-blowing you know, experience to know all, all these details. Um, I have a, uh, two questions, actually. One is actually, uh, when we implement the 3G, so there was a huge uh, change in our um, you know, the smart mode. Smart mode revolution has, has been happened, right? So uh, when, when, we, when we are going to implement 5G as well, actually, do you think, actually, is there any huge change going to happen in, when it comes to smartphones, or are we going to get rid of this thing? This well, like I was showing on the slide, the 5G, we don't know what it may end up. It may be just a glass like this, maybe something. You don't even need a glass. You just talk in the ether world somewhere. Okay. I, I don't know. But uh, it all depends on how much innovation can be there. And obviously, Silicon Valley is the hub for all that. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's hard to predict right now. But one thing for sure will happen, the smartphone factor will change. How will it change? I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of projections in the next five years, you will see a glass like this as your smartphone. Yeah. Do, do, do you know any, any initiatives happening behind the scene, any companies working on the next? Of course. <laughs> 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 of course, but I can talk about it. <laughs> STC? Everybody. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> yeah. Next question up here. In, uh, in the uh, VR and AR space, you know, uh, what are some of the industrial application areas that you've seen, especially with the impact of 5G, that uh, do you see, you know, having a, a big turnaround? Uh, mm -hmm. Because 
there has been uh, there have been bottlenecks there you know, with regards to bandwidth and so on. Mm -hmm. so, but mm -hmm. you know, specific industry areas, you know, if you can talk about. It. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's the easiest question. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I don't know how many of you, I'll just give you an example, then I'll answer your question. Uh, I think it was early this year or late last year, there was a press release from Bell Helicopter. And what they did was they used uh, the VR headsets and they designed their own design and collaboration platform. Uh, they claim in that press release that 1,000 engineers across the US and some outside the US collaborated through VR on that helicopter design, that was designed from scratch. And they finished the full design, including simulated uh, flight testing and everything, in six months, as opposed to six years that it takes to design a typical helicopter. And this six months, they did not create a single piece of hardware, not even 3D printed. Everything was in VR. And after it was done, fully flight simulation tested and everything, then they started the first prototyping of the device with the full confidence that this will fly, could it succeed, it succeeded. So when it comes to 5G, and just thinking an example like that in a collaboration environment, I mean, in that situation, engineers had to be in their offices or somewhere where they have full access to the uh, device, the uh, software, the on-premise uh, software, as well as the uh, wireline network infrastructure to enable that. But with 5G, I could be sitting on a beach and helping with the design. So it's, it really immensely helps that. Um, uh, uh, the, some of the applications that are low-hanging fruits today in enterprise that we are actually selling into, collaboration, training, education, and then healthcare. So healthcare, uh, uh, we have a portfolio company that's actually using VR, AR to provide you a 3D image of your brain, your particular brain, not a sample brain, your particular brain to the neurosurgeon so they can actually see inside and they can actually fly inside your brain, uh, literally. And these uh, doctors are, or surgeons are collaborating across uh, different hospitals. And they can then see what's happening and plan the surgery and figure out exactly how to operate, practice the whole surgery in virtual world, and then go and do the real surgery. And I'll give you an example on that one. About three, four years ago, there was a case, this patient in, uh, in Cleveland he had this big tumor uh, right where this cortex, I, I forgot what the terms are, but there's the spinal cord and the brain cortex joints. There was a big tumor of a golf ball size, fully surrounded by your nerves, veins, all that stuff. I'm not a biologist, so, sorry. But so that patient went to the surgeon and they looked at it, they did MRI, CT scan, and all that stuff. And the doctor basically told the patient, look, it's so complicated. If I operate, you die. If I don't, you die. 50-50 chance. What do you want to do? Uh, I mean, if, if I don't operate, you have two, three months, and you can do whatever you want. So he decided not to have the surgery. And basically said, okay, two, three months, I want to meet everybody in my family. Month later, the surgeon found out about this company, which happens to be a portfolio company. Uh, found out about the company, which was just down the street from Case Western Medical School. And so the, the doctor called the company and said, hey, this is the situation. How can you help? Let me see if you can, it, your technology will work. So they basically loaned the equipment to the surgeon. And what they did was they took the CT scan and MRI scans, which have about 500 frames each. They created a 3D view uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the VR. And then they superimposed flight simulation test uh, uh, technology. Because the founders of the company are two former Air Force pilots from Israeli Air Force. One of them was designer of simulation software, other one was a tester and a F-16 Air Force pilot. So they knew what they were talking about. So they superimposed the fl flight simulation technology on the uh, image. Hmm. I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> that will not go away with Python. Yeah, that one, that's the device problem. <laughs> so a anyway. So uh, the surgeon took the equipment on a loaner basis, and he just tried to see what he can do. And what he found was he was shocked that he could not do a traditional surgery on that uh, uh, tumor. But if he went straight through the nose without drilling the skull and went straight, and he found like a dime-sized gap on the, uh, uh, the tumor that was visible straight from here, like visible means medically visible. He could just go and do it. So he called the patients, look, I have had new technology. I can operate on you. 
80% chance you will survive, 20% you may still die on the bench. What do you want to do? He said, let's do it. Three years, patient is happily living ever after. So, so, so these things, and the, where 5G comes in that scenario, here this was one doctor. But now their surgery is happening with the same equipment where doctors are remotely available. And they're able to collaborate in planning stages and guide each other, and then the surgeon goes and does the surgery. So it's, it's happening today. All right, we got time for one last question. Okay. And it's actually coming from Tim Jaggers, our videographer. It's the first he's ever asked a question. Okay. So okay, we'll, we'll put a 5G sure chip in your camera. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, no pressure, right? Yeah. Um, so I find myself in the mountains a lot and you know, doing different kinds of outdoors activities. And my biggest pain point with my tech devices, I lose service. And a lot of the stuff I'm trying to track, like my speed and distance, if I'm snowboarding. Or also, you know, like if you're like deep in the woods, you know, your device could be your lifeline if you get lost or hurt, but you don't have that because almost everybody loses service. So with 5G, I mean, would it only take a couple 5G satellites to, you know, have enough broadband to cover all these valleys that it's not feasible to put all these antennas that you probably can't even get zoning for? Well, so 5G is not off the satellite, unfortunately. Oh, it's... It's all not all satellite. It's, it's all antennas. Now, will it be in the mountains? The, uh, as for the standard, the goal is yes. What so will it, how will can you put enough antennas up there? I mean, are you going to remove the need for Mount on trees. Or? Mount on trees. They create a mesh network on them, so you don't need a wire coming from each tower all the way back. Okay. Yeah, but, but it's up to the operators. It's the capex for the operators. Do they have the ROI? And it comes to business decision at that point. Praveen has been on a number of my panels this year, including at Capital Club, and uh, I want to thank him for his dedication by working. Whoa, with him. that's great. <laughs> thank you. The IPO jacket, which he can wear every day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. That's great. Oh, that, okay. That's great. Thanks. Eric. So you'll be styling. you be styling with that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So now it's time for a raffle. So has everyone come out of one end of the raffle already done so? Well, once, once, twice, we'll knock these off really quick. So, we'll start with Pearl Packer. It's a nice notebook. I got this at the World Marketing Conference last week. Uh, the winner is. Drum roll, please. Oh, you know, like this, Roger. Remember right. S.C. Milani? This is S.C. Milani's book. She's one of our regular panelists. Unfortunately, it's not signed by her, but you can get signed at the next event that she's going to be appearing at. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the uh, Roger yeah. Rappaport's card back. <laughs> and the winner is. The winner is. Drum roll. Jeff Golden. Jeff. Come on down. Like, that's the lucky fight. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Congratulations. All right, glad you came. Huh? Oh, there are more. Oh, there are more. But wait, there's more. Yeah, there's a lot more. Uh, like four out. payments? <laughs> <laughs> Three payments. Our iceberg is melting, changing and succeeding under any conditions. John Cotton, and the winner is? Jason Steinberg. Jason, come on down. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? Absolutely. It was, wor it was worth, uh, worth all that gas money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Not yet. <laughs> Howard Schultz, onward, and it's actually signed by Howard Schultz. Wow. Wow. So who goes to Starbucks? Valeri. Anyway, Valeri is. Yelushkish. Valerie. He's there. He's there. Hey, Valerie. Valerie. You, you want, want your one? prize oh, or oh, not? Sorry, you snooze, you lose. Sorry. <laughs> Wait. Should he get this or not? You must be present to win. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Were you present? No. From? You were not present. <laughs> You'll smile for the camera. Thank you. So this is Anita's book. And you can get it signed by the author herself. So. And this will make you happy. All right, Steve Kirchner. And I'll take a picture with you. 
Be happy. He looks happy. <laughs> All right. This certificate entitles Barrett to 30 minutes of phone consultation in support of achieving your personal strategy and success for your, you and your team. And that's with Jeff Colvin, who teaches a leadership class through Stanford Continuing Studies, which I took a couple years ago, which explains my impressive leadership skills. <laughs> so you too can have the same qualities, and here's your opportunity. And the winner is Tom Morrison. Tom, come on down. He wants to know, wants to know what he won. He won the chance to become the greatest leader of all time. Oh, wow, thank you. And, and uh, Jeff will be your coach. Speaking of which, America's Game, the NFL 100 by Jerry Price, greatest of all time, the GOATs. And it is signed by Jerry Rice. The greatest of all time. So that would be a nice stocking stuffer. Christmas. And the winner is Kamal. And the gone winner once, is gone twice. Kamal. You must be present to win. Gone once, gone twice. Kamal, you blow it big time. <laughs> okay. And the winner is Darsh. Darsh, gone once, gone twice. Darsh who? Darsh. Darsh is not here. Okay, we're running out of cards here. Yeah. Okay. Ben to Ben. ben. Oh. IBM, just in case. Is it Mercedes yeah. Benz or IBM? It's got both. Congratulations. Smile for the camera. So now here is the grand prize. And yes, it is. An awesome, valuable prize. A free pass to all ideas, IPO, proprietary events. Not for life, just for January 2020. <laughs> Not only get your hopes up, just for January 2020, but we have a lot of events lined up in January 2020. And the winner is? There is Vikram. Right. Vikram, you must be present. Oh, he's present. Okay. Congratulations. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming. You can stick around, network, socialize, and connect. As a courtesy to Procopio, we'd like to leave the building at whenever. Whenever. He said whenever. <laughs>